Netflix's Iron Fist sucks. Like, it's so bad. You know those movies that people say are so bad it's good and like to watch them for fun, right? Well, Iron Fist isn't even that. It's genuinely a miserable time. I can't say enough that you shouldn't watch Iron Fist, as it would only serve as the worst possible way to just delete time from your life. Anyway, so I watched every episode of Iron Fist. And here are my thoughts in no particular order. So I uh, came on pretty strong in the intro, huh? Let's lighten the mood with some good stuff about Iron Fist. And if you're thinking, well darn it, Iron Fist is a piece of art and like all pieces of art, they usually have varying degrees of quality in different aspects. Just because as a whole you view Iron Fist as bad, doesn't mean that literally everything about it is bad. There has to be something good about it, right? And to that I say, Alright professor, why do you hit me over the head of your PhD? You better make it count! Anyways, if you think that, then you're right. I was just being dramatic for the sake of the video. There are good things about this show, surprisingly. For one, I do think the actors who play the characters in the show are very skilled at what they do. I think what bogs them down isn't the acting, but rather how the characters themselves are written. More on that later. Wait, dang it! This was supposed to be the positive section of the video. Alright, positive vibes, positive vibes. Another thing about the show is, I like its diversity of characters. There's a large amount of Asian characters in this show, and they represent large swaths of Asia. A lot of people forget that India is indeed part of Asia. I feel like a lot more shows should do this, but that's neither here nor there. Another positive for this show is that occasionally, the main character, Danny Rand, acts really compassionately to others without concern for himself. I mean, ideally, that's what a show about a superhero should be like, right? How do I explain this without getting into Danny as a character? So long story short, Danny is a billionaire, and I know, wow, what another billionaire superhero? How crazy. I know. Anyways, there's a small part of the story where Danny finds out that his company's chemical plants might be causing people to get cancer. And according to the news, it's possible that Rand Enterprises activities could be at fault. However, there's not enough evidence for regular people to sue the company, especially because Rand Enterprises has, you know, really expensive lawyers on retainer for this exact thing. When Danny is confronted about the damages his company is possibly causing by somebody who's protesting outside of Rand headquarters, He's immediately like, my company's doing what? That's terrible. We have to make this right. And this causes a whole situation where Danny's statement is seen as a tacit admission by his company that they're at fault. And everybody, like the board of directors and all the high up people, get pissed at him because they're like, no, Danny, you can't just do that. If you do that, then one, we're going to lose a ton of money in business. And two, we're going to have to pay out a whole bunch of money. And they want Danny to issue an official statement where he claims that he had a lapse in his thought process and he didn't understand the situation and his company hasn't been making people get cancer so they can make money. Like legit, they're gonna have to go through PR training and have a team of people write a script for him on what to say. So Danny asks, is what they're saying untrue? Are what the things that the people are protesting for untrue statements? If so, he'll gladly apologize for this misunderstanding. And the current CEO of Rand Enterprises tells him that Rand Enterprises has been cleared by the EPA on the responsibility for the cancer. If anything, they just lose money and lose face if anything comes out of this. The best move is to do the classic PR statement and act like nothing is their fault and just continue to make money. Denny then has to go to the meeting with the board of directors where they have to deal with the situation that he caused. His friend and sister to the CEO, Joy, presents him with the speech he's supposed to read to the press and he goes to the meeting. At the meeting, Danny then proceeds to throw out the script and tell the board that Rand Enterprises is shutting down that chemical plant and keeping every employee who worked there on payroll while also paying for the investigation into what's causing the cancer and for medical treatment of everybody affected there. And finally, Danny tells them that he's already informed the press of everything he's told them just now. The board is absolutely pissed at Danny, like oh man are they furious. So Danny Rand did one cool businessman thing. What a great guy am I right? 
No such thing as a good billionaire? Come on guys, what are you saying? Danny Rand just helped all those people with the problem his company probably caused. What a hero. I'm definitely gonna tweet at Danny on Twitter.com with my most epic Wojak god writing that gave me physical pain. There's also one more thing I liked in the second season of Iron Fist, but I'll talk about that after. And there you go. That's everything positive I could say about Iron Fist's show. Literally everything. And even those came with deep caveats. Now, let's talk about the bad. But I mean, look at how long I talked about Danny doing an epic stonk moment. How long can I talk about how bad this show is? Let me just check how long this video is and... <laughs> Wait, no, that, that can't be right. <laughs> there's, there's gotta be some kind of mistake here. I can't talk about one dumb TV show for that long, can I? Someone stop me. Please! Danny ran this, Danny ran that. Who is this dude and why do we hate him? So I have this thing I like to use, which is a main character can make or break a show no matter how good or interesting it is, like for real. If I don't like a main character, what's the point of me watching their journey? Honestly, that's one of the reasons that made me dislike the anime Kakegurui. The main character, Suzui, just does nothing. Like someone wrote blank slate on a post-it note for his character, and then they just ran with it. Full marathon and never looked back. Like just make Yumiko the main character at that point. Anyways, I still like the show, but I, I digress. The point is that a main character can make or break a series. Daniel Thomas Rand Kai, more commonly known as Danny Rand in the series, just sucks. Like, he's so terribly written. Alright, let's get into the main man himself. Danny Rand is the son of billionaire Wendell Rand. Wendell has a 51% ownership of a Fortune 500 company, Rand Enterprises, which he founded with his friend Harold Meacham. They don't really ever talk much about Danny's childhood, but it's understood that his parents were very loving and cared for him deeply. If you know anything about the show Arrow, this part's gonna sound very familiar. Wait, I'm thinking about it now and it's like really eerily similar how these two white billionaire dudes' origin stories are. Well, if you ever watched the CW show Arrow, get ready for a whole lot of deja vu. And also, get ready for a lot of lore for a show you'll never watch. Hopefully. One day as a child, Danny and his parents decide to go on vacation and take their family's private plane. While flying over an unknown area in China, the plane has a terrible malfunction and crashes, killing everybody but young Danny Rand. Danny, as the only survivor, goes to the nearest settlement he can, which happens to be a place called Kunlun. Because this is based on a comic book, Kunlun is a magical city, which I I don't even know how to describe it. It's like it's like a city that disappears from Earth magically. It appears like every 15 years or something for some reason. I, I don't know. Maybe they need, need supplies or something. Look, all you need to know is that it's a magical city that teleports in and out of China like every 15 years and is magic. Danny is in Kunlun and is raised as a monk there by the people who live there. Because unfortunately, by the time he gets there, the city has already disappeared and so he has to wait for it to reappear before he can return. While in Kunlun, he obtains the power of the Iron Fist. The Iron Fist being like, oh man. Okay, this description is gonna sound very dumb, but I stand behind it, okay? Have you ever played an open world video game with like a skill tree and it has like unlockable late game progression? You know how there's like an attack you can unlock late into the game that like uses up all of some kind of dumb bar you have and kills a ton of dudes all at once in like one big blast? Well, that's the Iron Fist. It's like Danny Rand pressing L3 and R3 at the same time to do his ultimate. In layman's terms, the Iron Fist is just Danny focusing all of his chi into one attack that just lets him one hit KO basically everybody. It's just like a cheat code that lets him win any fight in the story which means like for the large part of the story, they just kind of have to nerf him. For both seasons, there are separate plot lines on why Danny can't activate his Iron Fist. And I mean, if your main character has an instant win button, you have to weaken them or like there's going to be like no tension, right? I guess. Well, actually, I kind of disagree with that because Netflix Marvel's Luke Cage is a direct counter to that. But, but still, I understand it can be hard to write when your main character can just win whenever they want. So you're probably thinking, well, Danny has this so-called Iron Fist. Why don't they just send out enemies who have, I don't know, the golden shin at him or something? Well, it turns out the Iron Fist is some like legendary ability to the point where only one person can get it. 
and to get it, you have to defeat a dragon named Shao Lao the Undying. Does this sound like dumb comic book stuff to you? Because that's exactly what it sounds like to me. Anyways, how did this dumb, rich white kid beat an undying dragon? I'd like to know too, honestly. Also, also, to even fight the dragon, you have to beat everybody else in Kunlun and like prove you're the best and that you deserve it. Not only did Danny prove he's like the best monk in the village of indigenous monks, but he also obtained like the ultimate privilege in that village. So not only is Danny Rand like the best monk in all of history, he's also the best capitalist because when he returns to his hometown, his father's company falls to him. Danny Rand is the richest monk alive. A sentence that just seems, I don't know, wrong to say. Words that feel like they shouldn't belong together, like, I don't know, League of Legends and happiness. So everything that I've stated about Danny so far are things that are also true in the Iron Fist comics, which means everything I've said to characterize Danny about his backstory can also be used to make good stories. In fact, despite everything I said so far, I do actually like Danny Rand, which is what makes it so much more painful. I like his depictions in the comics and the cartoons, but what they do to Danny in a live action show, dude? They've massacred my boy. Danny Rand has to be balanced between two extremes, monk and billionaire. Making that work is not very easy. In fact, it sounds impossible, but it's not. And I know it's not because the best version of live action Danny Rand exists outside of Iron Fist. So you know how the Avengers have that movie called uh, The Avengers, where after all the solo movies, they all team up together and take down a big threat? Well, Netflix Marvel's shows have a show like that, and it's called Defenders. In Defenders and after the Defenders show, whenever Danny Rand shows up to just, you know, hang out with another member of the Netflix Marvel gang, he's legitimately just a great character. But in order to talk about what makes him so good, we have to talk about what they mess up in a solo show. Like I said before, Danny Rand has to walk a tightrope of being both a monk and a billionaire. And honestly, the thing is, he fails horribly at doing both in the Iron Fist show. So like, when you think of a monk, what image pops into your mind? For me, it's people who are both connected to the world in a spiritual and physical manner. Also, monks exist in the real world, so I'm gonna avoid speaking about real life monks because I doubt me playing a monk in Dungeons and Dragons allows me to speak with any authority about monks who exist in real life. But monks in media, you either think of a chill, neutral monk who wants to avoid conflict and is in control of their emotions, or like a warrior monk who is all of those things but will also fight for what they love. Either way, monks are just generally like supposed to be more in control of their bodies and their emotions than most people. Cool, cool. Yeah, so Danny Rand is absolutely none of that. I can't state enough that Danny Rand is not in control of his emotions. Like, dude blows up so easily. Like, in season 2, it becomes a legit plot problem. Danny is such, like, an emotional guy to the point where the bad guys begin to, like, manipulate him because he's so easy to read. He falls into so many traps because he basically just wears his emotions and thoughts on his sleeve. Like, I'm supposed to believe this dude was the best monk in a village of indigenous monks. The only time Danny's monkhood is like brought up as a character trait is when it's useful to a situation. And I don't mean like where it's getting like, oh, he's too heated. Oh no, Danny is gonna have a heated gamer moment. No, it's more like Danny walks into a Chinese restaurant and starts speaking Mandarin. Danny sees an Asian woman who's teaching martial arts and he wants to go tell her how wrong she is. Okay, but Danny's also a billionaire. How does that play into his character? Literally, it doesn't. It doesn't ever at all. It lets Danny be like, oh cool, look at this cool car I bought, guys. But at no point in the Iron Fist TV show does Danny being a billionaire actually factor into his character that greatly. To the point where in season 2, Danny just abandons his post at Rand Enterprises and gets a normal job. Like, he still owns the company and has all the money stuff, but he just refuses to use it. Like, what is this guy's problem? Like, if I give a monk one billion dollars, I feel like they would find a good and creative way to use it. Like, maybe starting a charity, or instating universal basic income or something. Like, I don't care what your politics are or how you feel about billionaires, but I feel like if you gave a monk one billion dollars, they would use it like this. But Danny Rand does the worst thing possible with his money, which ironically is the most billionaire thing to do, and hoards it. 
He doesn't find any creative uses. He doesn't donate it. He just ignores the fact that he has all this money as if ignoring it will make it as if he's not participating in this company. Like by ignoring his company, he's no longer part of the capitalist chain and a member of the ruling class. You know, he's just your average Joe. Danny Rand feels like a character you play in a tabletop game where his backstory only ever comes up when it's specifically useful. He's like a blank slate white guy who can fight. And then when the game master is like, okay, so you find yourself at a Chinese restaurant to the players, the dude playing Danny is like, wait, a Chinese restaurant? My character was a monk. I will begin speaking fluent Mandarin to the workers. And then the game master is like, uh, okay, so they serve you and you all have a great time. And then the dude playing Danny is like, I had a great time, right? All right, I buy out the restaurant. And also my character is a secret billionaire. And then literally every time, he's just like a normal dude who has no cultural influences from his life as a monk because the dude who plays him just forgets about it. That's what Danny Rand feels like. A dude with a blank slate and then the things that should define him only come up to make him look cool but end up just feeling really shallow. If you want to be devil's advocate, you could say, well, Danny grew up with monks and before that he was a kid. So he doesn't have any concept of money. He was too young to understand money and by the time he was old enough, he was living ideally with a bunch of monks who just don't use money. And honestly, I would agree with that. But that's never portrayed as text in the show. Like if you wanted that to be one of Danny's flaws, you'd have him be very bad with managing his money, which he is. And then you'll have him learn why his understanding of money should change. But Denny never evolves past the kid in GTA in his spending habits. And when he does, it's an outright denial of his money. Either he's buying lots of buildings and fancy cars, or he just ignores his money completely. Which I feel is the worst option. And this is really indicative of Daniel Thomas Rankai as a character. He constantly just makes the worst decisions or like dumb decisions and never grows or changes from them. Like, it's fine if a character makes dumb decisions and then grows, but Danny never does, except in one instance near the end of the second season of the show regarding his girlfriend Colleen. Which gets me to the next topic. Sure, Danny sucks, but what about the other characters? Media where the main character is like a blank slate and everybody else is a really cool character exists and works really well. Maybe that could be the case for this show? You fool. You absolute fool. I, like, how do I say this? Everyone sucks. Like, for real, the bad writing extends to every character with no exceptions. I don't like a single character in this show. The closest I come to liking a character, I guess, is Colleen. She's honestly pretty cool. They characterize her a bit to the point where you kinda get, like, who she is as a person, but then, like, not a bit more. Okay, so Colleen Wing is Danny's love interest for the show. She's a Japanese-American woman who owns and runs a dojo out of her apartment where she teaches people self-defense and also on the side, she does illegal cage fights, but she keeps it as a secret so as not to damage her reputation or something, I guess. If I had to describe her personality, I would say she's like a cool level-headed warrior mixed with like a person who just wants to help people. And I think that comes across with her occupation. She just helps people to learn how to defend themselves. But with cage fighting, it's easy to be like, ooh, she's got a hidden other side to her. Well, yeah, she does. You know how animes love to do that thing where there's like a smaller person who gets into a fight with like a big muscle, huge man, and then the small person like stomps on them? Yeah, well, that's Colleen. Legitimately, I think that Colleen is probably one of the best characters in Iron Fist, if not the best. She's a great martial artist who can destroy dudes in a fight, and she also helps people learn how to defend themselves. She runs her own business, She's basically just the definition of a badass woman. Which makes the mystery of why she's even with Danny even more confusing. Okay, so let me tell you about how these two originally met. So, Danny is just returning to America from Kunlun, right? Danny looks like a homeless person. Dude doesn't even have shoes on. So he sees Colleen putting up ads for her dojo. And then dude walks up to her and starts speaking Mandarin Chinese at her. And can I just say, yikes. Like for real, yikes. Colleen wouldn't even give him the time of day. And like, can I just say, I don't blame her. It's tough out there for women. Fellas, do me a favor and don't be creepy with women. Thanks. Anyways, back to the funny punch man show. So Daddy then follows her back to her dojo and begins to tell her how she can better run her business. And Colleen is like, you better not be here tomorrow for my classes. Then tomorrow comes, right? What happens? I'm gonna be silent and let you tell me what happens, all right? 
Not what you think happens, but what actually happens. So, uh, did you say Danny returns to the dojo next day to Colleen's dismay? Because if so, you win, uh, one point. Use it wisely. Anyways, not only is he there, but he's teaching her students how to fight. Like, in this show, this is supposed to be cute, and you, the viewer, are like, I know Danny Rand is a good fighter, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with him teaching people how to fight. But this is absolutely insane. In no way is this alright if you're Colleen. Not only has this weird homeless man followed you home, but he's also insulted both your job and your business. And right now, he's actively trying to prove that you're doing both of those things completely wrong. Danny then tries to prove that he's better than Colleen by them fighting. And oh man, I wanted Danny to lose so badly. I really did. But this show isn't called a flesh fist, I guess. Anyways, Danny wins and shows her up. And eventually they start dating and stuff. And like, I'm not crazy, right? Like, this is super weird. Danny is this huge loser weirdo to Colleen and she falls for him? This is actually one of the themes of the show. Danny Rand is a very entitled dude and instead of humbling him, the universe rewards him instead. But I'll be honest, this does sort of get fixed in the second season. Not in a way where you're like, oh man, this is great, but you're more like, finally this happens. I'm not happy, this is the bare minimum, and now my suffering is lessened. Thank you, Iron Fist Raiders. Anyway, so now we get onto the Meachums. So Rand Enterprises is a company which is owned primarily by two families, the Rands and the Meachums. And because all the Rands are, well, you know, dead at the beginning of the show, it's being run by essentially only the Meacham family. The children of the Meacham family are now the highest ranked people in the company, people who Danny would have grew up with. So the Meachams have two kids, Ward and Joy, with their father being Harold, who started the company with Danny's father. So Ward and Joy represent the worst parts about Iron Fist, the business side of Iron Fist. I don't know what they were hoping for, dude, but there are multiple episodes that are business centric that are so boring and pointless. So, rightfully, the Meachams are a bit suspicious when someone claiming to be Danny Rand shows up and wants to claim 51% of their business. If this was true, it would cost them possibly the ownership of their company and essentially billions of dollars in potential income. So there was so much back and forth between the Meachams trying to not let Danny get part of the business because surprisingly, billionaires don't like it when you threaten their income. Like dude, all the business stuff takes so much screen time. And let me save you the trouble. It's all boring and in the end has no meaning at all. I'd like you to imagine a scenario where you have to watch hours of business procedure and it's super boring and it's all about the legitimate rights of Rand Enterprises and all that. And it's all about how the Meachams can't give Danny his rightful position because they'll lose everything they've worked for etc etc blah blah I don't care. And then a few episodes later they randomly just decide to give it to Danny anyways. Like I'm not joking. On a whim they decide to give Danny his 51% of the company. And after that, they act like nothing ever happened. Like, this was hours of business procedure, assassination attempts, having Danny committed to a, a hospital for the mentally ill and convince him the entire identity was made up and that he was actually somebody else. Actually, the last one was kind of interesting, but it eventually goes nowhere. Like, Danny believes it for a bit because he's drugged and he can't use the Iron Fist because he's drugged. So he's like, wait, am I actually not Danny Rand? Is everything I know fake? And then eventually the drugs wear off and, it, and he's like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm Danny Rand, like really quickly. Anyway, so hours of your time wasted just because they didn't want to give Danny his stuff and then they just give it to him anyways. I can't underplay how out of left field it feels and how everything that happened up until this point just feels absolutely pointless. It's like they wanted Iron Fist to be like half Mad Men, half Daredevil, but they also wanted Danny to get his money in the end so the next show Defenders would make a lot more sense. So they just gave up and were like, I don't know, Harold Meacham just tells Ward to give him all his stuff back. and then. He doesn't give Ward any reason why, so we never actually know why he does it. So there's half the show, just gone. Boring business stuff, who cares? Okay, but what about Ward and Joy? Well, Ward is the CEO of Rand Enterprises and despises Danny. Not only because Danny is just an idiot, but because Danny just shows up and uproots his whole life, I guess. Which, to be honest to him, is completely fair. I don't really care about gigantic business dynasties, but Ward's hatred of Danny is definitely justified. Ward is like a mean business dude type who's got like a drinking problem. That's his whole personality. And to be honest, in the second season, he gets a lot more development, as well as Joy, but they're still both pretty lame characters. 
Joy is, to be honest, I don't really remember anything about Joy. I went to the wiki to see if I remember anything about what she did in the show, and this is the first thing I saw. And when I tell you, I was howling when I read that. Oh man. Anyways, Joy was close friends with Danny when they were young. So when Danny comes back to America, he goes to Joy and he's like, hey, it's me, I'm back. And obviously, if one of your close friends came back from the dead, you'd be a little bit suspicious. Danny ends up later breaking into her house to convince her that he is indeed Danny Rand. And say it with me, everyone. Yikes. Here's a note for all the fellas out there. Don't break into women's homes. Not a great thing to do. Not a great look, to be honest. So do you see what I mean when I say Danny just sucks? Anyways, back to Joy. Joy is a headstrong woman who's very good at business. She basically inherited the rant side of the corporation after they all passed away and she's been keeping it up and running. She's a good business person while also not being a terrible person in general. She's actually genuinely the only member of the Meacham family who has some sort of pause at throwing Danny into institutions and throwing assassins at him. All the other characters are pretty lame or unimportant besides Claire Temple and Misty Knight. But they're from the other shows so I won't really talk about them that much. But they actually are really good characters and I enjoy them whenever they're on the screen. So let's talk plot. Are you ready for some more Iron Fist deep lore? So besides all the business stuff, what's Danny fighting against? Daredevil has Kingpin, otherwise known as Wilson Fist. Jessica Jones has Kilgrave. Luke Cage has Cottonmouth. What's Danny Rand, the immortal Iron Fist and sworn protector of Kun Lun fighting against? A group of bad guys called The Hand. If you watched Daredevil Season 2, you might remember them. Essentially, The Hand are a group of five people called The Fingers, I, I know. And they're trying to destroy Kun Lun, I think? Because Kun Lun is like magical like them. So they want to take over the world and Kunlun can stop them or something. All I know is they want in to Kunlun and it's the job of whoever bears the Iron Fist to stop them. And like Kunlun, the people in the hand are magical. They can even bring people back from the dead. While Kunlun uses its magic to mask itself from the world, the hand does ideally the opposite. They use their magic to take over the world. They own several of the biggest companies in the world and then are using their resources in the normal world to find a way into Kunlun. So normally it's the job of the Iron Fist to guard Kunlun from members of the Hand. Like literally, they stand at the front gates beating up goons and stopping them from entering. However, Danny has an even better idea, quote unquote. Instead of honoring the cultural practices of the city that raised him and gave him the highest honor, he's gonna go out into the world, find and stop the Hand himself. How well does it work? Well, at the end of season one of Iron Fist, Danny decides to return to Kunlun because it's still open with his girlfriend. And while climbing up the mountains, they find blood mixed into the snow. And then eventually, they find that Kunlun is gone, implying that the Hand has destroyed the city in Danny's absence, and the people of the city tried to defend it but were unsuccessful. Danny's selfish actions caused the entire mystical city of Kunlun to just die. In season 2, Danny's old friend Davos, who escaped the carnage and the attack on the city, tells Danny that he had literally one job, protect Kunlun, that's why he was given the Iron Fist, and he failed that job, so therefore he's literally the worst Iron Fist in all of history. Davos is pissed at Danny, and rightfully so. Danny Rand's actions are not only dumb and hurt the people around him, but also cause mass death and destruction. But Danny is still supposed to be the special cool guy that we all love. Season 2 of Iron Fist fixes a lot of the issues with the first season, but it's still not good. Like, it really does address a lot of the issues that made season 1 just lame and boring with a critical eye, but the problem is, you don't care. The things in season 1 are being examined critically, sure, but I still don't care about most of these characters, and then by extension, what's happening to them plot-wise. So what do I mean when I say things are looked at critically? Well, first people begin to question if Danny should even have the Iron Fist, if he's the most fit person to wield the legendary Iron Fist. As season 2 goes on, it's shown that Danny becomes more and more emotionally unstable until the point where he's literally just fighting to relieve stress, which is something you don't want in a hero if I'm being honest. It's become so bad that Ward sees Danny fighting and his use of the Iron Fist and likens it to his drug and alcohol abuse. It gets bad enough that Danny has to be stopped before he might kill somebody. Danny does do some self-reflection and realizes he's probably not the best person to use the Iron Fist. 
He's endangering everybody around him, and in a move that honestly makes a lot of sense, he gives the Iron Fist to Colleen. If you're wondering how he can just give it away, there's some mystical ritual stuff that's literally not important. But Danny recognizes that he's not the best fit for the Iron Fist, and that Colleen is a person who fights with more pure intentions. There's no worries of her accidentally offing a bad guy just because she's a bit angry. And so he gives it to Colleen, who he believes will be able to do the most good with it. And you're thinking, well, that's his girlfriend, of course he's gonna give it to her. They do eventually break up, and Danny doesn't, like, I don't know, come back and ask for the fist or something. In a very mature move, Danny puts his emotions aside and gives it to the person he believes can do the most good, who happens to be Colleen. And honestly, I don't disagree with him. This also fixes another problem people have with Iron Fist, the whole white savior stuff. The fact that Danny Rand is a white man who went to Asia and out asian all the Asian people there and obtained their ultimate reward rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Especially since in the first season, it seems like that was the worst call possible. By giving it to Colleen, it doesn't absolve him of all the mistakes he's made or the writers, but it does mean that he's trying to do better for the future, which I appreciate. Ward and Danny also develop a closer friendship, which is cool. At the end of the show, they're basically on a, like, a buddy cop adventure together, which is kind of fun. In the second season, Danny has given up his money to live a quote, average life, in a move which I very much disagree with. Danny's best friend from Kunlun, Davos, shows up. He's brown, which is cool. Good Asian and brown representation. Also, Davos is pissed at Danny for letting everyone die, which, yeah, makes sense. The comic character Bloody Mary shows up, and she's alright. I feel like Bullseye from Daredevil Season 3 did a much better job of humanizing and creating their villain. Mary seems a bit half-baked in my opinion. Danny beats the quote bad guys and stops Davos from stealing the Iron Fist, he leaves Colleen with the Iron Fist, him and Ward set off to fight crime around the world I think, it's kind of unclear. But that's Iron Fist Season 2 in a nutshell. It wasn't offensively bad like the first season, it was just boring bad, if I'm being honest. That's why I didn't go into too much detail about it. There's really not much to say besides it's kind of just boring and forgetful, and it does fix a lot of the problems from the first season, but that doesn't make it a better show. My girl Colleen finally gets the love she deserves, and also her and Danny aren't a thing anymore. So let's talk about the most disappointing thing about Iron Fist. I have a question for you. Have you ever had a friend who you saw hang out with someone else? and they just gave off a completely different energy than when they hang out with you? Like, when you saw them, you were like, whoa, who is this person? I've never seen this side of my friend before. And you're like, wow, my friend's a lot more complex and layered than I originally thought. But in the back of your head, there's this tiny intrusive thought, a thought you know you shouldn't be having, and one you're gonna regret even allowing into your head, which is, why aren't they like that with me? What is it about that other person that I don't have? Do you like them more than you like me? And then you're like, wait, those are dumb thoughts. My friends wouldn't be my friends if they didn't enjoy spending time with me. And people act in different ways around other people. If someone treated everybody the exact same, that'd be a bit weird. You intellectually understand that, but the dumb emotional overthinker part of your brain lets that thought roll around in your head from time to time. Anyways, so that's my relationship to Netflix's Marvel's Iron Fist. You might be wondering, okay Darnell, that was a very specific example, is there something you need to tell me? And the answer is yes. About Iron Fist, obviously. So the reason my relationship with Iron Fist is like this is because I know for a fact that Danny Rand can be a good character who is capable of growth. I am legitimately 100% certain about this. How do I know this? Was there some comic where Danny was good and I'm just extrapolating? Maybe some mental gymnastics? No. The character of Daniel Thomas Rankai actually shows up in the other Netflix Marvel shows and he's legitimately a really great and fun character. In the show Defenders, where all the Netflix Marvel people team up to stop the hand, Danny is, I think, at his most intelligent. In the Defenders show, Danny comes to a realization. A lot of bad evil people coincidentally happen to own gigantic corporations. Wow, what a revelation Danny. Proud of you. Anyways. You know how a lot of stories it turns out that bad guys are like this gigantic and powerful shady shadow organization who have roots in every aspect of our lives and it's basically impossible to take them down because they have so much power and influence? Well, Danny figures that out and he does what I think is the best move in all of the shows combined and remembers, hey, wait, 
I'm the owner of one of the biggest companies in the world. Maybe to the 99.9% of the world, these companies have basically infinite power, but we are on the same playing field. I can use my money, power, connections to take these evil corporations down. And he does that. Danny uses every avenue available to him to take down evil, shadowy corporations, and it's legitimately great. He even has a line when confronting the hand where he says, I know you're the ones who manipulate everything at the bottom and you protect yourselves behind so many shadow figures and shell corporations that it's basically impossible to pin you down. Well, guess what? I know it's you and I'm here to stop you. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but Danny can basically destroy the structure and attack from the top. These evil shadow corporations would be the ultimate bad guys and take like eight seasons to finally defeat in any other show. But Danny Rand has the resources to immediately head to the final boss and start fighting. It's legitimately a fantastic idea. I wish he used this part of his brain more. It shows that Danny Rand is capable of understanding, even at a basic level, that his power and privilege offers him opportunities to do great, good, and access to other things that people could never get. This is Danny in Defenders. Granted, he's still a big, dumb, angry fight guy in this show, but it shows that Danny is capable of evolving beyond how I've described him up until this point. It shows that Danny understands that he can use his money for good, rather than just ignore it like in Season 2, or buy fancy cars like in Season 1. But that's not the furthest it goes. If this was peak Danny Rand, I would have given up on him a long time ago. So I'm going to put a content warning right here for domestic violence. I don't feel like there's anything else I really need to say other than if you don't want to hear any of this, just skip to the time code that should be on the screen and that should be everything. All right, cool? Cool. In the second season of Luke Cage, Luke's girlfriend Claire leaves him because she's had enough. Luke's heroing has taken up basically every part of his life. He has no hobbies, no free time. Every second of every day, he has to be thinking or doing something heroic. And it's become destructive. All aspects of his life not related to heroing have become non-existent. The thing about a hero is you have to be very decisive and very quick about every decision you make. Because the more time you hesitate, the more time it takes you to process and the higher chance of somebody dying is. There's no room for grays in heroing. You need to make everything black and white to keep yourself sane. At least, that's what Luke Cage believes up until this point. By not allowing himself time outside of being a hero, Luke finds that he's always in hero mode. He's always on edge and always at 100% intensity. Claire is worried about him and tells him, rightfully, that he needs to take a break. Every human needs a break, and it's not safe for him or good for their relationship. And in one of the most intense conversations in, I would say, all of Marvel, Luke and Claire begin to argue like a real couple. Listen, my parents got divorced when I was young, and all I have to say is this scene awakened a feeling in me that I don't like. Near the end of the scene, Luke begins to get louder and louder, more aggressive, he's moving his body around more, and then he smashes his hand into the wall, leaving a large hole next to Claire. Something about Luke Cage that you need to know is that like all Marvel stuff, he's got like a superpower. Luke has unbreakable skin. He can punch a hole into a tank with literally no effort. But you don't need unbreakable skin or a magic glowing fist to harm your partner. Anybody is capable of harm. After this happens, Claire tells Luke that she grew up in an unstable household and she is not having any of this. Luke then tells her that he'd never hit her and he's not that kind of guy. Claire says she doesn't care. She's unsafe and she's leaving. She is then gone for the rest of the entire show. And I want to emphasize something at this point. Luke Cage is the hero of the story. He's the good guy, the person we're rooting for. I don't think the writers of Luke Cage would have written him to be an abuser. But I can absolutely believe that Claire made the right decision. Even if there was a 100% chance that Luke would never harm her, I still think she made the best decision possible. I want to say something really quick. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel unsafe with your partner, even if you know for a fact that they would never harm you, please, for your safety, get out of that situation. Like, for real, seek help. Anybody is capable of harm. I don't know what best is for every situation, but please, if you ever feel unsafe, leave, seek help, or both. In the description, I'll leave some resources if you ever find yourself in one of these situations. Anyways, after Claire leaves him, Luke finds himself in a rut. He's pushed away the woman he loves through his heroing, 
and he's got no way of coping in a healthy manner. The only thing he knows how to do is fight bad guys. That's what got him in all this in the first place. You and I both know that Luke is a good guy. I mean, the show is called Luke Cage, and sometimes people get pushed over the edge, but that's no excuse for what happened. He has to live with the consequences of his actions. He needs to sort himself out so this never ever happens again. But he's got no way of doing that himself, and no one else can understand the stresses of being a hero. With his only support system gone, what will Luke do? With Luke at his lowest point in the series, he gets a visit from a familiar face, Danny Rand. Danny comes in to check up on Luke, to see how he's doing at the best of Claire, because clearly things aren't going well. There's only a few people on the planet who can understand what Luke is going through and also take him down if need be. Luke and Danny are allies. They work together in the Defenders show to take down the Hand permanently. Danny Rand is the perfect person to visit Luke. He tells Luke he knows exactly what he's going through and can help him. The Danny Rand who appears to Luke is a person I've never seen before. He's a man who's confident in himself and very cheerful. He exudes charisma. When Danny walks into the barbershop that serves as Luke's home base, he starts cracking jokes and engages with everybody equally. This Danny Rand is actually a delight to be around. People actually enjoy being around him and he seems content with himself. And he's here to help a friend in need. This is the ultimate Danny Rand. He's fully self-actualized, content with his life, but he's also open to learning. I'll get to that in a bit. So Danny tells Luke he can help him. The monks taught him many ways to channel their emotions, and Luke replies sarcastically, we gonna meditate? And Danny says, hey, don't knock until you try it. It never hurts to try. Danny is using his monk teachings to help Luke steady himself, something that would have helped him in his show, I'll say. Anyways, later Luke takes Danny to the main base of the bad guys. It's this sort of mix of a no man's land and also the centerpiece of the community. Needless to say, if you're not welcome there, you get thrown out, but also you don't start fights there. So Luke and Danny enter the building, Danny 100% expecting a fight as he's posed and ready to brawl, yet everybody just stands there looking at them. Danny's like, why aren't they attacking us? And Luke replies, because I just walked in with a billion dollars. And Danny says, hey, I'm more than my money. I barely even use it anymore. And Luke says, to them, that's all they see. And Danny's just like, huh. I think this moment is very important because it shows us that just because Danny is a fully realized monk, it still shows us that he has a bit to learn when it comes to being a billionaire. I'll be honest and say Danny Rand does not command your attention. He doesn't feel intimidating. Danny just doesn't have much of a presence, but down in Harlem, where people are struggling to survive poverty and racism, money is a deciding factor. Danny, by virtue of being born with a platinum spoon in his mouth, commands respect, whether he likes it or not. His money is important, no matter how he feels about it. This is one of the moments where Danny gets to experience a completely different way of life. Danny Rand, like I said before, was born with a platinum spoon in his mouth. He's never had to know struggle. Either he's had billions of dollars in a massive company, or he was a monk in a place where money doesn't matter. He's never once had to reflect on his way of life and the privileges he gets to enjoy. The fact that Danny can just choose to ignore a billion dollars isn't something that anyone can just do. Most people don't have a billion dollars to catch him if they fall. Danny Rand though does, and because he's never had to think about his money critically, he's never had to think about the lives of the people who don't have money. For this one moment in Luke Cage season two, Danny's whole worldview is challenged and in a way where no words need to be spoken. No one's telling Danny that he's wrong, he's experiencing it firsthand and having trouble understanding it. In this moment, Danny Rand truly understands the power that his money holds and the responsibility that it bears. To Danny, money is neutral, it's an afterthought, but for the rest of the world, it's what dominates our lives wholly, whether we like it or not. Danny and Luke then go on a fun side adventure where they take down some dudes who are growing drugs. And Danny helps Luke cope with his emotions and problems in a healthy way and gives him the building blocks to help himself. At the end of the fighting, the building they were fighting in takes a lot of damage by virtue of a man with unbreakable skin and a dude with a glowing magic hand. And Luke is like, oh man, what are we gonna do about this building we just destroyed? And Danny's like, nothing wrong with destroying a building that you own. And Luke is like, what? And Danny tells him that he bought the building and that maybe he's been looking at his fortune in the wrong way. This one episode of Luke Cage does more for the character of Danny Ran than two seasons of his own TV show does. Not only is Danny a fully realized monk who uses his teachings to help himself and the others around him while also being very charming and charismatic, 
He's open to learning and changing their worldviews when they're challenged. This Danny Rand is the perfect blend of monk and billionaire. This is how you write Iron Fist. This is the ultimate Danny Rand. A fun, cool guy who is flawed and knows it and is open to learning more. Anyways, those are my thoughts on Iron Fist. I am finally rid of this curse! Let me know what you thought of my review and what you would want to see me talk about next in the comments. Also, if you like what I had to say, subscribe! If you decide I'm a big dummy loser you don't like, you can always take it back later. Thanks everyone for watching. Hope you have a great day.